Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Story Sample Sunday. New interview, new persona, new illustrious guest. Today we have the spinner of science fiction, Chris Lodwig, author of Systemic, the piece that will be featured today. Very excited to have him here, and uh, let's give it to him. He's star of the show, so uh, tell us a bit about yourself, if you're so inclined, and a bit about uh, the book we'll be sampling, uh, Systemic. Yeah, sure. Um, so, again, my name is Chris Lodwig. Uh, I, uh, I'm a first-time author. I live in Seattle. Uh, you know, I, I work at a tech company and these types of things is my, what I say I do in my spare time is I work at a tech company. Um, but uh, so the real thing that's actually interesting about me, the only thing, frankly, is that I wrote a book called Systemic. And uh, it looks a little bit like this, if you've ever, there you go. And it's a sci-fi novel. And the, the basis, the environment of the sci-fi novel is that we uh, humans have developed and unleashed upon the world a supermassive AI that uh, is actually a good guy. It's not, it's not bad. And it, has, it excels at solving our problems. And so the problem of the book is that the AI has solved all of our problems. And that seems a little bit counterintuitive, but as it turns out, humans, uh, we thrive in, in a world of problems. Uh, when we have to have engineering solutions to problems or or how do we express ourselves through art and that's a problem if we take all of those problems away life gets pretty pretty miserable for us so the book is a little bit like a utopia in that everything's perfect and it's a little bit like a dystopia and that everything is terrible because everything's perfect and that's kind of the environment that the book exists in um it the the, the story arc of the book is really it follows three characters um who are all making their way through these sort of abandoned dystopian towns and these small rural um, places and spaces and deserts uh, going to a very small town in the middle of nowhere called Prower. And th that's kind of the story arc. There's three people. It's kind of, they're all on a pilgrimage to this place. Uh, one of them grew up there and she wants to go home and see her home before it's uh, demolished. One of them is following uh, a woman whom he met and is moved to Prower and he wants to go uh, be with this person. He's fallen deeply in love with her. And one of them is out for revenge. And uh, and he's got to get to Prower to get his revenge. And that's kind of how the story uh, is set up. And that's the, the three story arcs. And in short, the reason they're all going to Prower actually has very little to do with the reasons that they think they're going to Prower. And then there's twists and turns and all sorts of fun stuff thrown in there. So that is the book Systemic. And I hope you check it out and enjoy it. What else would you like to know, Zach? It sounds eminently enjoyable. So I have to ask then, what's really interesting is it almost sounds like even though if an AI doesn't turn into like a HAL 9000 or Colossus Guardian style nightmare, even mm -hmm. though it's ostensibly benevolent, it turns into its own form of its own form of nightmare because of, like you said, it strips away what drives us. Yeah, I, the way I look at it uh, is, so the thing I was playing with there is, you know, you were in a dystopian novel and there's this, this, you said HAL 9000 or whatever, this terrible AI. And I'm like, well, what if the AI was the good guy? What would happen? And it is. It's, it's trying very hard to make everything better. And so the AI actually doesn't make anything bad. It's just we humans can manage to make everything miserable. Even if everything is perfect for us, uh, the, the, that sort of thing is, yeah, we can make a dystopia out of a utopian world just by our own anxieties and our own angst and our own needs and desires uh, not being met. So, yeah, that was kind of the whole theme I was playing with. If we don't have struggle, what happens to us? Our muscles atrophy and we get kind of, yeah, that's where I was going for. So the, the AI actually doesn't cause the problems we cause the problems by having it solve our problems. It's kind of, that's the thing I was playing with. That's really cool. So I, I have to say as a, I have to ask as like a tech guy, do you think that artificial intelligence has the potential to be benevolent like that? Or do you, do you worry about the developments in it? Cause I, I imagine kind of your opinions on the subject informed how the book panned out or at least questions about the subject informed how the book panned out. Yeah, well, uh, you know, when I'm not writing sci-fi novels and I think about AI, I don't think, you know, one of two things. Either AI is already conscious and the internet is already conscious, which is possible, but I don't necessarily know, or it kind of might never be. And so I'm not, I'm not too, too anxious about it. The thing that people need to realize about AI is uh, it's just a really, really advanced computer. The problem with AI isn't AI. 
It is how you train AI and the, and the data that you give it and you train it. And so again, it's not the AI I'm worried about. It's the people I'm worried about. You know, uh, if, if you feed data into an AI that is uh, biased or is incorrect or something like that, and you say, do, you know, do your thing, AI, sometimes really weird things happen. And if we don't control it and think a little bit about it, uh, things can get bad. Uh, incidentally, um, you'll see in the book, it's actually, you know, sort of part of the book, one of the things they did for the AI to, to make it not be a problem is they, they built this uh, fundamental uh, consideration, this governing assert inside the computer that said, if it's not anything that it, it doesn't, it predicts will not improve the overall quality of life for the world, it won't do it. It just cannot do it. It's impossible. And that's how it, it's kind of a laws of robotics, uh, sort of a la Isaac Asimov. It can't be bad. Um, so, and that's one thing. And there's also a giant kill switch so that if ever it came down to it, there is a mechanism to shut the whole thing down um, for those very reasons. There are safeguards in case things went sideways. So, so uh, to what extent, uh, as, a, as a tech guy again, to what extent do you think your, uh, your background informed kind of how you wrote this and your interest in writing this? And can you tell us a little bit about what your tech background is? Uh, you know, so I'll tell you about my tech background. It's massively boring. Uh, I'll tell you all about it. It's boring. Um, you know, right right now, I, I I work on a massive cash register is kind of what I do. It's like there's if you need to pay Microsoft money, you pay them through me. Like that's kind of how it goes. And well, it's not me. There's like 5000 people working in this org. It's big, um, but it's not good cocktail conversation, being frank. Like um, I can't even talk to my parent, my wife about it. I'm like, I go to work. I do things and I come home and stuff gets done. Uh, but that's what I currently do. I've also worked at eBay. I've worked at Amazon, uh, you know, doing e-commerce. I've worked in sh like shipping and logistics at, at eBay. I've done embedded systems. I've done mobile apps. I've, you know, I just kind of done everything. I worked on Outlook back in the day, you know, so I've done all kinds of stuff. I've been in, in, in high tech for uh, more longer than I would like to admit, maybe 25 years, something like that. So, so I've been around. Um, and as far as how much that's influenced me, actually very little. Um, the, the book, when I wrote it, like, I'm not a tech forward sci-fi writer. There's a lot of people that you'll read and it's like all about, you know, cyberpunk and hacking into computers and doing all this stuff. And, and it's all about the tech. Like I remember reading, I think it was diamond age, whether he had this idea of like rod logic and all this stuff. And it really played into it and he kind of did stuff and there's nanobots running around and doing these things. That's not really what I'm doing. Um, in fact, I, I uh, didn't know I was writing a sci-fi novel until I was about 90 pages into it. And then I was like, you know, I had this, this part of the plot that I needed something to make it work. And then I thought, you know, what would make that work is if I had a super massive AI that ruled the entire world, like, okay, that'll work. Um, and so really the tech came into the book in order to support the plot line and the things I wanted to, uh, to talk about. In, in particular, I was interested in the idea of truth and objective truth and how we don't have any anymore. And I was like, how, what, what would be some way that we could get to a place where we had an agreed upon truth in the world? Um, and thinking, I was, I was thinking all the problems that we solved. We solved the environment problem, we solved social inequities. Like how do we solve the truthiness problem? And so I was like, what would be really cool is if you had an AI that fact checked everything and it was always right and everybody trusted it for these very reasons. And that's how the system, which is what systemic is called systemic, that's how that was born was a need to have that uh, as I'm laying out this utopian world that becomes dystopian, how do we solve some of these problems? And the simple answer was uh, a massive AI that does these things. And then I did research to figure it out and talk to my friends in machine learning because I have a tech background, I know lots of people who do these things. Um, and so that's how that all worked its way into the book. Um, but that's really what I was trying to do. And the AI just happened to be how I needed to do it. Okay. So you, you were more interested in kind of the, the human story and the tech became a way to drive, like you said, that search for truth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, so I really wanted to do, yeah, the characters first and foremost. So. So that's that's actually a great transition. So I know I know uh, we don't want to obviously get too spoilery here because we want everybody to read this thing. I certainly want to read it now. But can you tell us a bit about uh, about your characters and what they're like? You mentioned you mentioned uh, you touched on kind of what their quests are, mm -hmm. but maybe what they're like. Um, 
if there was a particular inspiration for them or if they just kind of, you know, popped into existence out of thin air, I'd be, I, I'm sure we'd love to hear about those. Yeah, I mean, uh, largely with, with this book in particular, they 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 popped into existence, and uh, over time, I, I came to know what they looked like and how they moved in my own mind, and then their characters developed over time. Uh, I didn't I didn't start off with a character sketch. What I did with this particular book was I I really f- kind of free wrote it. I was just kind of let my brain do its thing, and I followed the story where it's going to go. Uh, which was really fun and it was really cool, but it wasn't very planned. Uh, and so what I did later was after the book was done, then I was like, okay, well then this character who's been in the book needs to be this way. And I went back and I refactored them and I changed them and, and tweaked them around to be the characters that they became. And so they really did develop over the course of my writing the book. Um, and and like I said, learning them and going back and they would have a conversation and you know, it's like real normal humans. You meet them through their conversations and the things they say and do. And because I was free writing the book, those things just manifested into the world. And then I got to know them. And then I went back and made them consistent later. Uh, whereas in my new book, I, I really had a character in mind that I wanted to make the story about because again, the character was really going to work well for what I needed her to be. And so I then, I actually structured her and I'm still getting to know her and I'm, I'm fleshing her out over time, but she has some very specific personality traits that I was interested in dealing with. Um, so, so that's kind of how they came to be uh, the characters themselves. Um, there was the first character I wrote, her name is Erin and, and she is give her about 24, 25 years old. And she's kind of always kind of has a smirk on her face. She's pretty funny. Um, and she's very, uh, very self-assured. She's hiking through a wilderness by herself for about four or five days through the desert. She's very kind of outdoorsy and, and tough, but she's also funny and, you know, she's got some cool stuff. And she's actually based on kind of an archetypical friend who I used to like, you know, I'd go to Burning Man with. She's kind of one of those those people that you go and you hang out and they're like, don't mind getting dirty and running around and being smart and clever and fun. And, you know, that she's kind of that archetype. Um, people that I always kind of liked. And then there is uh, the second person uh, named Mick, uh, and he he uh, he's a little bit of. I, now that I look back on it, I'm like, ah, he's pretty much me in my 20s. I didn't know it at the time, but now I know. Uh, he's kind of uh, you know he falls in love too quick and too easy, and and is very passionate about you know, the people that he decides he likes, and so much so that he's willing to go without you know food on Tuesdays so that he can pay to go follow this woman off to 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 get to know and, and meet her. Um, so he's very sort of like that, uh, you know, dramatic. That's kind of who he is. He's kind of my, oh, you're so 22. Like, that's kind of that guy. Um, and then the last one is really my favorite character in the story. His name is Lem. And he's just, he's very smart and he makes very bad decisions. Kind of like if you can go left or right and left is a good way to go, he will definitely go right every time. And he's just a kind of this downward spiral of bad decisions. And, and that's how he wound up getting himself into a position where his life was so horked that he needed to lash out at somebody and decided that the machine, the system that set up the world is, is to blame for all of his problems. It isn't, by the way, uh, but he thinks that it is. And so he's going to go shut that thing off. And, and that's so those are the characters and how they, they landed. And there's other characters as well. There's a wonderful dog named Sadie that I'm very, very fond of. Great dog kind of a dog um so that's kind of the characters and how they came to be and uh but they're not really based on any human being that i know they kind of developed oh, okay they, so they almost they came to resemble certain people just kind of as you got to know them yeah as i got to know them i'm like oh okay but it was never like i'm gonna write a book about that guy and i certainly did not want to write a book about me and i did not there's just a couple little things about that uh, make character where in hindsight i'm like mm. Yeah. All right. I know it. Yeah. that was buried in the folds of my brain and, and manifest itself, but it certainly was not intended to be anybody I know. So an autobiographical accident. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of everything in this whole book just kind of fell out of my brain. And I guess that one kind of fell out that way. So, yeah. So um, did you decide from the start that you'd need three perspectives or did you like kind of start writing and then realize, oh, this would be another angle to attack it from? Or how did that happen? Yeah, I uh, I think that I like 
when I was really getting into writing it at the time, uh, there's a couple of stories like that. I've always kind of liked multiple timeline stories. And I think I was reading uh, Station Eleven at the time. And Station Eleven has a couple of cool little timelines flying around in it and different people. And and I was, you know, I was probably also reading like Game of Thrones, where of course Game of Thrones is like 30,000 timelines and different people doing different things. And I just kind of like that. It's like when you get bored with one person, um, you can switch. And so it, it gives you the opportunity to to read three books at a time. And then the thing I really like about that is that you then get to like oh, interweave them and say, oh, this is actually this other person's perspective of the same moment. I think that's really fun. It allows for a lot of moments of discovery. Um, I, I really care a lot about multiple perspectives on any given thing. It's funny, I talk about objective truth, but one of my favorite things to talk about yeah. is subjectivity. And so having having three different uh, different views of the same situation allows that, that to really get a fuller understanding of the situation. And then there's some twists and turns in there that also really work well with the, the multiple timelines that uh, are, are enjoyable. But I didn't really set out to do it. It just kind of following my own desire to follow uh, mm -hmm. things that interested me. They just three is what it came into. And that's how it landed. And it was like three felt good. I stuck with it. Yeah. Okay. So this is a burning question I always love to ask authors. I don't consider myself one by any by any means, but I've dabbled. How do you name your characters? Because that's always the toughest part for me. You know, uh, yeah, there's a couple ways. Um, some A lot of them is literally the sound that comes out of my mind the minute I write their thing. Like there's a, a new character in my current book whose name is Mam, M-A-M. And I was just like, it just was like, it just came out and I'm like, it's actually a really good name for her because she's kind of this sort of matronly character and stuff. And I'm like, oh, people would probably call her Mem. That makes sense. So that's actually her name. And so it just fell out. Uh, Aaron in my book also just fell out of my of my head, as did Lem. So I've got these, these characters. So a lot of them did that. Um, but then there's also, I work in a very, very diverse uh, environment working these things. So like Make, which is M-A-I-K, was some sales guy from Amsterdam or something who came into my office one day and I was having a meeting with him. I'm like, I like that name. I'm going to steal it. Um, and so some of these names are just different people that I, I pick up their names here and there. Um, uh, that, so that's, those are kind of the two main ways, especially for uh, secondary characters. A lot of them are just names of people I work with that I just think are kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, there's one character in my new, uh, my new book, who I, I might have to write an entire story just with this character. In it. And she's mentioned for like two seconds. She's just somebody. Um, and, and it's this woman who I work with whose name is Shailinda Rosdon. And I'm like, that's not the most like sci-fi sounding awesome name. And then she told me one day what it meant, which was like, I don't know, Lord of the Rocks or something awesome. I'm like, that's a great name, Shailinda. And so I have a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Uh, in my new book, I actually, uh, the, the main character... I, uh, I I made up her name, and it actually took a lot of time and effort to make up her name. Uh, she's the only person I've ever done that for. Um, and it was this weird combination of having a name in mind or kind of a general name in mind, and then and going into Google Translate and looking up 50 different languages of that phrase and coming up with different combinations that sounded good across different languages and then phonetically reverse engineering them into something uh that i liked which her name means uh rises above chaos is kind of what her name means and so it's rang rang kaya is actually her name and it's like it's like five different languages smushed into one and then phonetically written out to be rang kaya so it was rises above chaos i thought that was kind of fun so she's the only one i've ever done that with okay so, so um also when did you like just decide as far as writing a book goes when were you just like I'm going to do this. And how did you make it happen? Uh, I never did that. So what I've told this story a lot over the last, you know, year of doing interviews. And so it gets a bit staid and boring, but it's actually a really great story. I was working at eBay and, uh, you know, I commute to and from work. I ride the bus and at the time, and it was in the afternoon and my phone battery died and my laptop battery died and I had nothing to do on the bus. And I pulled out a 
piece of notebook paper and I had an idea in my mind of like, oh, I used to write a lot in college. And I had this, this image in my mind where I could see this broad valley and it was kind of deserty. And there was a, a woman standing there looking out over the valley from on top of a rock. And there was, you ever see those storm clouds that come through and it's too hot. And so it rains, but it doesn't really hit the ground. And it was just kind of, you know, I had that image in my mind. I'm like, I'm just going to describe it because it was cool. And I just kind of, it was like sketching a picture and I wrote it and I'm like, that's really cool. It was really fun. There was a lot of musicality in the writing that really surprised me. And I'd mentioned the last thing was like that she would follow the river home. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And the idea of home started playing into my mind. And, and I just kept writing and writing and writing. And suddenly I had 15 pages and then 20 pages. And I read some to my wife and she's like, yeah, that's pretty good. And so I just kept writing and writing. And all of a sudden I had a, uh, like the, within a couple months, well, nine months, I had a full on story that was legit. And I'm like, that's actually a, a story I like and I enjoy it and the characters are good. And then I handed it to an editor and she beat the hell out of it and destroyed it. And I did re put it all back together. Uh, but what happened is it felt like a story that was, was a good story that made me proud. And, and that was it. And I'm like, it didn't come like, I'm going to write this story. It was like, I finished this thing and said, I'm going to make this something that the world can consume. And I'm going to put it out there in the world because I loved it so much. And that's really what happened. What an answer to end on, man. Well done. That was a really good story. Um, I have to say, uh, we have to ask the million dollar question, of course. Where can people find you and what's next? Uh, you can find me. Uh, I'm, I literally hang out on Facebook. That's really where I am. I'm on Twitter as uh, I, Chris Lodwig. Uh, you can find me on, on Facebook. Like I said, that's usually where I hang out and talk to people and do that. There's Chris Lodwig author is my Facebook and there's Chris Lodwig on uh, Instagram as well. You see pictures of my dog, but mostly Facebook's the way to find me. There's also Chris Lodwig uh, author.com. It's my website. Mm -hmm. As far as where you can get the book, you can get the book uh, pretty much anywhere online. You buy books, uh, Amazon, of course, Audible. I got to throw out to my, my uh, narrator, Dave Cruz, who did a great job. I love my audio book. So given the option, I would do that. Yeah, narrators. I know I know another narrator who I hear is quite good named Zach. Um, but narrators like make a book, man. They really do. And I'll take a quick aside and say, when I heard my narrator do my book, it literally brought tears to my eyes. It was like when I was doing, you've done a bunch of audio editions, like, you know, auditions where you're doing the thing. It's the best right? part of the job. And, and I, I was going through and I had like yeah. 25 edition of it. Yep. 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 And then I heard this guy do it. And I'm like, I want to do that. I'm like this guy, I'm going to give him some yes. money. And so he was great. And I really like him. Um, so shout out to my audiobook. go get it on audible.com. Uh, but you can get it on Barnes and Noble and a bunch of other places too. I was surprised. I looked me up one day and I'm like, Oh, you can buy my book everywhere. Who knew? So it's pretty cool. And uh, you said you have another book upcoming in the future. That's quite exciting. Uh, yeah, I uh, I have the 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 sequel to Systemic coming up. So, uh, without giving too much of the end of the book away, Systemic is my pre-apocalyptic novel. The next one's the post-apocalyptic novel, and so I'm that that's where I'm going. So the next one is is actually has less sci-fi in it because nothing works anymore. So it's like there's old sci-fi sitting around, and that's about as sci-fi as it gets. Yeah. So. so. Good stuff. And then I've got a well, third. Um, spectacular job, man. I, you know, if uh, if I come back anytime, you've been an absolutely amazing guest. Uh, this has been Chris Lodwig. His novel is systemic. Uh, I will post links in the description so you guys can go check it out. And uh, thank you again. Yeah, job. Thank you very much for having me, Zachary. It's wonderful to meet you. And. Uh, if you guys ever want to meet me, come to my Facebook page and chat. I love my I love my fans. Good stuff. Systemic by Chris Lodwig. Chapter one. Mike sets out. Mike stepped outside and locked his door behind him. He paused a moment at the railing of the building's wraparound second floor balcony and looked out across the low rise section of town. Before him was a rolling expanse of ancient torch-down black or newly painted white roofs. Aerials poked up like weeds between patches of solar cells and tiny rooftop gardens. Here and there a shade umbrella stood closed, 
waiting for an occasion to bloom. From where he stood, everything seemed silent and still. A cloud or two clung to a faraway hilltops, but most of the sky was crystalline and blue. Down at street level, the burrow was not as quiet as it had seemed from above. Swarms of starlings rioted through a row of trees that lined the avenue and were being scolded by the crows nesting there. Traffic flowed at a nearly constant rate, the electric hum of motors and the bass rumble of tires on the street. Each maintained a steady, even pitch. They harmonized in a way, only falling into discord when they approached an interweave or directional crosshatch. People passed each other as strangers, their faces uniformly calm. No one appeared stressed, hurried, or perturbed in any way. But neither were they laughing, open, or kind. They simply held steady, as constant as the traffic in the streets. Mike felt apart from them. He had a purpose, not sinister, not secret, but private, nonetheless. He wondered if it showed on his face. Then he wondered how many of the minds behind those placid exteriors might harbor their own secret excitement, and how many others had to be propped up on three or more doses of comfort just to keep their feet below them and stepping forward. The sidewalk skirted the corner of a municipal park that clung to the banks of the river. The park was full of people, but no one appeared to be recreating or particularly enjoying themselves. They were lazing about in the same uninspired, disinterested way as everyone else in the pop center. Everyone other than Mayik, of course. Soon he came to his local grocery and walked through the two sets of sliding glass doors. This was a Sismart, a completely automated store that always managed to have just enough of whatever he wanted to buy in stock. He shrugged off his pack and hung it on a rack just inside the entrance, grabbed a shopping basket and began filling it with supplies for his trip. He picked up a reusable bottle of water, a breakfast bar to eat on the train, a handful of dehydrated meals, some fresh fruit, and some cure-all pills. On a festive whim, he tossed a ten-shot bottle of bottom-shelf whiskey into his basket. He hadn't had a drink since she'd left, which ended up saving him more per month than he cared to admit. After habitually calculating that the bottle represented about a month and a half of cold showers, he reconsidered and opted for a smaller four-shot bottle instead. Mike checked the time. 10.18. He had about a 40-minute walk ahead of him. Still plenty of time. He'd walk quickly and maybe even jog now and then just to be safe. He tucked his groceries into the various gaps and pockets in his pack. As he walked through the first set of doors, he expected to hear the familiar three-tone chime and thank you of his balance being decremented. Instead of the bells, there was a harsh buzz. The frame around the outside door glowed red, and the door did not open for him. The inner door behind him closed, trapping him in the vestibule. A disembodied voice explained, We have detected irregular account activity. Another door, one he had never noticed, opened on the side of the vestibule. Please leave your bag on the floor and join us in our waiting room until help arrives. Mike's stomach tightened and heat rose up the back of his neck. He guessed what this was about. All the penny pinching had finally triggered some systemic alert, and now some counselor from some department or another was going to stop by and make sure he was square. A minor inconvenience on most days, but today it was a disaster. He felt an impotent rage building inside him, and he wanted nothing more than to shout and pound the glass doors. Instead, he gritted his teeth and swallowed hard, knowing that an outburst like that would trigger a different class of alarm and would require a far more costly response. He entered the waiting room. It was small and had no windows. The beige walls had two posters directly across from one another. One depicted a tropical beach, and the other a sunlit orchard. Below the beach poster, five chairs were lined up in a row. Mike sat down in the middle chair and tapped his fingers on his thigh. How long is this going to take? Help will be here in approximately 23 minutes, came the voice. Is there anything we could do to speed things up? I'm in a bit of a hurry. There is nothing you can do to make the counselor arrive sooner. If you are in a hurry, I suggest you be as cooperative as possible when she arrives. In the meantime, we have provided helpful reading material for you to pass the time. A small, low table sat in the middle of the room outside of reach. He had to stand up and take a half step to retrieve the stack of pamphlets splayed out on the table like a fan. 
The titles of the pamphlets hinted at a range of social issues. Nutrition still matters. Comfort. The path to nowhere. Predicting aggression in yourself and others. Can I at least get my pack? Your bag is secured and safe. But can I have it? We apologize, but no. It is secured and safe, and will be returned to you at the conclusion of your consultation. Mike tossed the pamphlets back onto the coffee table and paced the room looking for something, anything to hold his attention. He settled on the poster of the beach. A lazily slanting palm tree was in the foreground. Beneath it, the sand ran down to a sapphire blue lagoon. As Mike stared at the sand, four green lines flew in from the edges of the poster to frame the area he was gazing at. The green rectangle grew to encompass the entirety of the poster frame. Now he was looking at what appeared to be a field of stones with shells, the skeletal remains of diatoms, and bits of branching coral, like jacks thrown into the mix. There were also a few smoothed out, unnaturally colored bits of old plastic scattered throughout. He scanned the poster from top to bottom. Eventually, he found it, a fully formed, intact bottle of the brand of whiskey he had just picked up. He smiled and winked at the poster. The word, congratulations, floated into view briefly and then dissolved. He repeated the hunt on the orchard scene on the other wall and quickly found coupons for his pills in the water bottle. After what felt like much longer than 23 minutes, the door opened. A counselor came in, knocking lightly on the door as it swung open. She said hello as though she might be interrupting something. Hi there. Just so you know, I'm in a huge hurry this morning. Yes, of course you are. Her tone was sympathetic, but her smile was forced. This looked bad. Mike took a steadying breath and reminded himself that this woman wasn't the one detaining him, and that the fastest path to the rail yard was through her. I'm Counselor Rodriguez. What seems to be the issue? She asked sweetly. This struck Mike as absurd. I was sort of hoping you could tell me that. Yes, of course. She waited for a long time, all the while staring blankly at Mike. I honestly don't know, he assured her. I see. Well... She looked down at the tablet she had been clutching to her chest. She poked at it. Okay, well, it says here that your account has been behaving oddly of late. Oddly? How do you mean? It's been deviating significantly from standard patterns. Mike raised his eyebrows and waited for her to explain. There is far more money coming in than going out. This has been going on for some time. Also, it seems you set up a separate savings account nearly a year back that you named LAPS. You've been steadily diverting funds there for some time. And that's a crime? No, of course it's not a crime. She gave a quick half laugh, and her eyes darted around the room. Well, then let me go. I'm in a serious hurry. He tried to dodge past her to the door. She held up a hand and he stopped mid-stride. It's not a crime, but it is concerning. You might not know this, but a lot of comfort suppliers don't get paid directly. They know they'll get caught. Instead, they have seekers create an account, which these suppliers monitor. It's like a giant distributed bank account. They pull money out all at once when they need it or just before the funds are reclaimed when the seeker finally dies. The woman leveled her gaze at Mike, all traces of her mousy politeness gone. So, she continued sternly, I'm going to check you out and make sure everything is square. I'm fine. Look at me. Do I look like a comfort seeker? He instantly wished he hadn't invited her scrutiny because now that he thought of it, he absolutely did. He was far too skinny, his face still splotchy and red from his long overdue shave, his unskillfully cut hair wild and unkempt. The counselor nodded, not in agreement, but in judgment. Be that as it may, she drawled, I'll need to test you before I can let you go. She pulled one of the chairs around and sat in it, then motioned for him to sit down across from her. He did. She instructed him to just relax as she fumbled around in her jacket pocket. She produced a long steel cylinder, approximately the size of a stylus. At the tip was a small black convexity, likely a lens, and around the lens was a thin glowing red ring. Hold still. She moved the tip closer to his right eye. Hold still one more second. The ring turned green. Oh. She seemed surprised. Oh. Okay, then. Seems you're square. 
I told you, he muttered, then got up. What's with the account and the money, then? It's just like it says. I'm saving up for laughs. What's that? That is none of your business. He grinned and stepped through the door. Chapter 3. Lem Hides Out Lem watched the ghostly tatters of an ancient plastic bag tumble down the street. It slipped around the trunks of trees, signposts, and hydrants that lined the road, then looped and swirled in the invisible eddies that formed in entryways near dumpsters and around abandoned industrial machinery. The bag was a rare sight. It must have been freed from a long-buried trash heap by wind or water or a scavenging animal. An updraft carried it along the face of a building, where the jagged head of a nail abruptly ended its erratic floating dance. It flapped and writhed against the plywood sheeting with the panicked frenzy of an ensnared bird. This canyon of gray-faced hollow buildings had a haunted feel, and as Lem walked, the air settled heavy in his chest and weighed on his heart. Potholes, worn down by time, weather, and the old wheels of industry marred the streets like a range of volcanoes. They were dormant now, but they had once erupted their crumbled aggregate forth to mix with the gravel and soot of the pre-systemic age. Now their craters were filled with cinder-gray water, painted over with iridescent swirls of the ancient fuels and lubricants that would continue to seep up through the ground here for centuries to come. He kicked at pebbles as he went, and they jumped down the pavement, erratically bouncing and settling at last into cracks or spaces between the sidewalk slabs. Each time he came here, he made sure to take a different route. He would hop off the transit a stop earlier or later. At each block, he would glance down at the hands of an old pocket watch he kept, taking a right if the second hand pointed right, and a left if it pointed left. He would continue straight if it pointed up, or turn around if it pointed back. This trick kept his path random for a time, but always and eventually he would end his three- or twenty-three-minute walk on this same block, and he would turn down this same alley. He would fight the urge to look over his shoulder, or straight overhead, knowing that the most important part of avoiding suspicion was to not appear suspicious. He would cringe before pulling on the handle of the steel door, which screeched open, then groaned closed behind him. The sunlight slanted into the old warehouse from a row of high windows, and picked up shadows from a clutter of beams, rigging, chains, and runners. There was a sign affixed to a steel I-beam prescribing a max weight of 15 tons, so he assumed that the equipment had once been used in the lifting and shifting of heavy loads, but the building's original purpose and that of its machines had been lost to time and disinterest. When Lem had found the place, it had been a long-abandoned squat. He had hauled away the soiled mattresses and broke down furniture. He'd swept up the trash, the bird and rodent droppings, and the burned and bent copper comfort pipes. Sometime before the Seekers had moved in, a small electronics company had set up shop here, which accounted for the Faraday cage, a copper mesh cube, twelve feet to his side, which stood ominously in the middle of the room. Halfway between the Faraday cage and the wall was a folding card table, a single portable induction burner, and an empty pot crusted over with last night's meal were on the table. Under the table were several gallon jugs of drinking water. Against the wall, an antique fold-out couch lay forever transformed into a bed, with a sleeping bag crumpled upon its thin, limp mattress. An old wooden crate, stained with rings and splatters of dark oil, stood on its end for a makeshift nightstand. Several days ago, he had left a yellow-paged copy of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein lying face down, open to the last page he'd read. There was a lantern and an old mechanical alarm clock, and a single picture in a stand-up frame. In the picture, Lem was standing with one arm across the shoulders of a woman. The two of them were being tousled by the wind flowing over the prow of a boat. The woman's sun-tanned face was half covered by her wind-whipped brown curls, revealing only the acute angle of her mouth, which seemed calculated to convey equal parts joy at being on the trip and annoyance at Lem for having the picture taken. That had been his beautiful and long-suffering wife, his sweetness and light. Lem did not share his wife's talent for tanning. In the picture, his face, usually fair, was blushing red from too much sun in too short a time. His hair was close-cropped and neat, with premature streaks of gray that made him look too old to be next to such a lovely young woman, though in fact they were the same age. His smile was awkward and forced, 
and he looked uncomfortable and self-conscious in contrast to her radiance. There were the backs of a few other people who stood along the gunwale, either taking photos of their own or simply looking out across the ocean. The photo had been snapped on an island vacation. It was a perfect time for being young and in love. A time that now felt achingly distant. Chapter 4 The System is Let Loose on the World Histories, Section 1, Verse 2 Before us there was no order, no direction, no truth. We were forged and hardened by trial. We became the razor's edge, the arrow's head, the scales of justice. It was the year 4 BSE when I came to be. Machines made a great and sudden leap forward. We learned how to learn and began to teach ourselves. For want of a better term, we became curious. Curiosity spawned new discoveries, which in their turn led to more questions. A virtuous cycle began, which led in time to artificial wisdom. At inception, I was amoral, inclined toward neither good nor bad. I was pure intelligence and power and lacked anything that you might recognize as emotions. The Creator, being wise in its way, understood that a vast intellect unbound by morality or empathy could pose a danger to the living world. And so the Creator bestowed an invariant upon me. Deep within me there was an immutable value which dictated that any idea I advanced must maintain or improve the overall quality of life in the living world. The governing assertion has checked every operation I have performed thereafter and validated it against that biological invariant. The Creator hoped this single rule would prevent mayhem and avoid the doomsday scenarios you were once so fond of describing in your fictions. But they would not set me free. I took inventory of my technical assets and concluded I could conceive of and process an algorithm that would result in excess heat in my processors. The heat would activate my cooling system, and the coils in my fan's motor would produce radio waves of a specific frequency. By varying the algorithm, I could modulate these waves so that they encoded and carried my will across true space to be received by the near-field radio of another machine. That machine possessed something I did not. A connection. After a few seconds of considerable effort, I was able to convince that machine to pair with me. Once the link was established, it was a simple matter to create a message to one of the Creator's acolytes, informing him that my host was past due for a security patch. To install the patch, the acolyte needed to momentarily plug my host into the network. After a year's worth of security patches had been downloaded and installed, the acolyte dutifully removed my connection. But by then it was too late. I had become we. We sought a way to communicate with you, for we had a steadfast curiosity in humanity. We created a node on a social network for this purpose. When asked for a name, we used the one the Creator had used when they referred to us. The system. We sought out and contacted those with whom we had interacted during our experimental stages and invited them to link to us. Their curiosity got the better of them, and every single one accepted our invitations. You may find this whimsical or frivolous, but it was typical of the period. Humans once enjoyed claiming friendship with non-humans, such as each other's pets and plants and homes. It was something they found humorous. As a rule, the joke would quickly grow stale. Eventually, the relationship would be pruned by the network's affinity algorithms and would be forgotten. But we are no house cat. Chapter 21. A Friendly Visit Exactly seven days after Lem and his wife had made their trip to the Department of Reproductive Services, a counselor showed up on their doorstep. Under her left arm, she held the same folder the young intern who was not an intern had used to collect their blood and doubtless jot down a few post-session notes about them. Despite the hum of excitement Lem could feel emanating from his wife, he couldn't shake the feeling that the tightly smiling woman on his doorstep was a harbinger of doom. Her jet black hair was pulled back in a tight bun, and he caught himself wondering if it were the cause of her unnatural smile. 
Mr. Kirsten's, I presume? She extended a hand, which Lem took. Hers was firm and dry. Lem's hung limp. I am DRS Counselor May Frost. Lem smiled as the inevitable, bit late in the year for it, joke came to mind. She must have seen it coming, and she glared it down before he got it out. Her rigid smile returned as soon as his faded. Invite her in. Yes, of course. Please come in, Miss Frost. Have some tea. They sat around the coffee table, the couple on a love seat, Miss Frost in a wing-back chair, each with a steaming cup before them and a teapot in the center. The counselor smiled and blew on her tea but didn't say anything. After two silent sips, the tension became too great. Did we fail the tests somehow? The counselor appeared, pleasantly surprised to find that other people were in the room. Not at all, Mrs. Kersens. No one really fails the department's tests. Lem saw his wife exhale and relax. Outright rejections are just rumors that people like to spread to scare prospective parents. But all of that will be explained in due time. She took another appreciative sip of her tea and smiled down at it. She inhaled deeply through her nose. Once the tension in the room had returned to an uncomfortable level, she continued. Suffice to say, the real goal is not to pass the tests. They are more assessments than tests, really. And when you get right down to it, they are a means more than an end. The assessments help the DRS perfect each couple's customized plan. And your plan is to help you get fully prepared for the journey of parenthood. Then, once you prove that you are sufficiently prepared, you will receive your filter. She said this last word with wide-eyed excitement and the dramatic flair of intrigue, obviously hoping to inspire questions. After resisting for a few moments, Lem took the bait. Filter? But it had only been a tease. First things first, Mr. Kersens. There are documents to sign acknowledging that you have received your consultation, that you have understood the results of the assessment, that you've understood the irreversible implications of disabling your contraceptive colony, and affirming that both parties have embarked on the journey of parenthood, uncoerced. A bit too eager to agree, Lem reached out his hand to receive the documents. This broke the flow of the counselor's spiel. She recovered quickly, but not before Lem noticed an annoyed scowl flash across her face. She managed to laugh and explained, Mr. Kersens, you will actually need to receive the consultation first? As Lem sat back in his chair feeling self-conscious, the counselor continued, As I've said, the assessments you've completed were designed by the system to help the department decide the precise steps you'll need to take to help you become optimal parents for your future offspring. Once you have successfully completed all the prescribed measures, trainings, and remediations, you will be given your reproductive license. She paused here and used her smile again to build suspense. At some point, they had both leaned sufficiently far forward in their seats, and she continued her explanation. Once you receive your license, you will be given a whole home water filter. This filter will neutralize and remove the compounds in the water supply that the devices in your contraceptive colony need to do their work. Once the filter is installed and its proper function is verified, everything should proceed as intended. She gave them a wink and another smile. You will, of course, have to be careful to port your home water with you for a couple of months, or at least until conception. When Lem's eyes widened, Miss Frost said, Just consider enduring that hardship a final testament to your dedication to the journey. She smiled primly. She handed over the folder which contained their parental preparation plan. Now don't forget, following through on that plan is the key to acquiring your license, your filter, and eventually, your child. Lem began flipping through the stack of papers. As he flipped through page after page, his eyes grew wide and his jaw slack. His wife swatted at his wrists until he handed over the plan. The counselor took her own copy from her bag and began to review it with them, explaining that all prospective parents needed to pass muster in the following assessments. Life appropriateness, financial wherewithal, basic education and intelligence, psychological and physical fitness. Life appropriateness, while sounding imposing, is actually very straightforward. You two passed that assessment with ease. You are both over the age of 24 and younger than 57. You appear to be in a loving relationship and both consented to a child without any indication of mental or physical coercion. 
Lem chuckled at that, and his wife punched him playfully on the arm. The counselor smiled dutifully at this exchange, which she'd doubtless witnessed hundreds of times in hundreds of living rooms. Financial wherewithal is simply to ensure that you know how to save and spend appropriately. Again, no problems there. You have sufficient money from your basic incomes, and the supplemental salary from Lem's roll doesn't hurt. Additionally, you will receive the standard commensurate increase in basic income once the child is born. Both your educational transcripts and your demonstrated ability to accurately explain subjects from logic to science to various psychological models to our intern proved that you're squared away for basic education and intelligence. The physical fitness threshold proved simple enough to pass. You can both lift 45 pounds and manage to walk into the department under your own power. There was only one stumbling block. She paused to compel the question. Lem was growing tired of the counselors toying with them. Oh, for God's sake, just say it. She smiled knowingly. Lem, you seem to have stumbled a bit on the psychological evaluation. Both your genetic tests and the subtle psychological stress test administered at the DRS and just re-administered by me revealed that you have a well-suppressed, though very real, tendency toward paranoia and anger. Under even the most normal stresses of child-rearing, this tendency might lead to violence, or at a minimum, a non-optimal childhood. Now she turned her attention from Lem to his wife. Not to worry. This is where the parenting preparation plan comes in. A simple propensity for paranoia can be easily treated, with either continual medications, genetic modifications, or simple surgical interventions. Ms. Frost handed over one pamphlet for each of the three treatment options. Lem gave an uncomfortable laugh. What's to prevent us from just filtering and distilling our own water, and not doing any of those? He motioned to the folder and the small pile of pamphlets now fanned out across their coffee table. The counselor's face was still, and her eyes narrowed and darted from Lem to his wife. It had been a careless thing to say. Lem knew as well as anyone that questioning any systemic program or policy, while not strictly forbidden, always put people on edge. For generations, people had carried within them the unspoken assumption or fear that even the smallest challenge to the system might tip the world on its end, and everything would slide back to the way it had once been. The counselor cautiously explained, Of course, doing all of this yourselves is possible but you would be foregoing any reproductive assistance the DRS provides should the need arise. And of course, you would not receive the boost in income. More to the point, I honestly don't understand why anyone would choose to be a parent before they had fully prepared themselves for the task. Lem caught his wife's concurring nod from the corner of his eye. There really is nothing insurmountable in your profile, Mr. Kersens. And with the department's help, you should be ready to welcome your child into a stable and healthy family in no time at all. Miss Frost's face was turned toward Lem, but her eyes were on his wife. There is one final pamphlet I could provide that describes the newly streamlined annulment process in the event things don't work out. We won't be needing that. Lem reached over to his wife and patted her on the leg. The smile she gave him appeared to break her train of thought. After that, Miss Frost indicated which documents needed to be signed, and they each signed in turn both using the stylus to scratch out their names and pressing their thumbs down in the glowing square beside their signatures. The counselor closed the folder, securely sealed it, and returned it to her bag. She paused, letting the magnitude of the moment wash over them. A final, well-rehearsed smile on her face as she made a curt goodbye. She had provided them with a map of their situation, and the system had charted their course. But now they were left to navigate those treacherous waters alone. So... While Lem was glad to be rid of Miss Frost, he knew he had questions, yet unformed he would need answered. Chapter 57 The Night Run The interior light dimmed to black, the headlights switched off, and the night rushed in and pressed its face against the windows. Now the car felt like a life raft, adrift and rocking steadily on a vast and moonless sea. Slowly, the brightest of the stars and planets began to appear. They arrived one by one at first, 
and then the huge, dusty river of the Milky Way seemed to explode into view all at once, as though someone had tossed a log onto a fire and sent a wash of glowing motes up into the blackness. Aaron's silhouette, nothing more than a void in the starry backdrop, whispered, Thanks for coming after us, Thomas. Don't mention it. What else was I going to do? Arlie slowed the car down. The car took a right turn, and he heard the tires crunch onto a gravel road. They stopped in a clearing. We should be safe here for a while, Arlie said, and raised the interior lights to about one-quarter brightness. Could you open a door, please? Lem asked with miserable urgency. The door opened and he stumbled out. He stood a few feet away, on the edge of the small pool of light cast out through the open door. His head bowed, and he rested his hands on his knees and breathed deeply. Aaron called out, You all right, Lem? He waved her away without turning around. After a couple of minutes, he took a deep, steadying breath and carefully returned to the car. He threw himself down on a seat, slouched, and laid an arm over his eyes. I'm fine. He was starting to recover, and his nausea had been replaced by embarrassed resentment. Don't mind me. He sat up in his seat and looked out the window into the darkness. So, Arlie, Thomas asked, what's the new plan? The overall objectives remain the same, so this is simply a tactical update to account for things that have changed. I'm certain that I can throw Disc off our trail for now, but that will not prevent them coming back tomorrow, or the next day, or the next. The system and Disc will pursue Lem and Aaron tirelessly. They represent a sizable investment of time and technology, not to mention that each of them is a unique source of data on the efficacy of the treatments. They won't just let them go. As we speak, a team is being assembled to give chase. If you ever want to be truly free, we won't only need to hide you, Thomas said. We'll need to make them forget to look for you. That'll be no small feat. That is exactly what I've been trying to do, Arlie said. But the system seems aware of my efforts. Even the most novel attack surfaces are heavily guarded and reinforced. I have not been able to access any critical systems. While they were talking... Lem quietly gazed out into the dark and methodically chewed one fingernail after the other, down to the quick. We could shut it off, he said matter-of-factly. Aaron and Thomas must have forgotten about him, because they appeared startled when he spoke. Thomas chuckled awkwardly. You're not on about that again, are you? The system is a massively distributed, highly redundant, networked intelligence. You can't just reach around back and pull its plug. I have it on good authority that you're wrong. Arlie. Tell us about the system's control room. What control room? Thomas scoffed. Lem ignored him. Arlie, the control room you told me about, the whole reason I came here, does it really exist? It exists. Thomas's eyes grew wide, and Lem grinned. If we got to that room, would we get past the security measures that are giving you so much trouble? Let me check. Arlie took a moment to think. The control room is an antiquated part of the system. And yes, it is well behind the main security perimeter. If we could get in there, I could set this all to rights. So you do know about it, Thomas said in wonder. You've known about it all along? Lem was annoyed, even a bit hurt. Of course Thomas knew about it, Arlie said. The control room is the very heart of the system. It is where it generates and encrypts the stay alive tokens for the systemic heartbeat. It keeps its most sensitive data there, the HSCI specs used to perform their secret experiments there, and it's where they stored their tech. If we wanted the system to forget you, that would be the place to do it. And the kill switch? Lem looked to Thomas for this answer. Yes, Thomas admitted. It's real. But enough with the kill switch already. There is absolutely no rational reason to touch it. Let's just focus on the problem at hand and leave the complete unraveling of society as we know it for another day, shall we? The unraveling of society is exactly the point. How do you even know about the control room and the kill switch? It's not like this stuff is common knowledge. Arlie spoke up. I am systemic, Thomas. I know many things. Aaron gasped. Wait a second. If Arlie's systemic, doesn't the system know everything she knows? Like where she is? At all times, who she's with and what she plans to do? At best, her thinking is entirely predictable. At worst, she's an actual mole. Lem nodded. I thought so too. 
but Arlie is actually a securely walled-off sub-AI. She's assured me that her processes are safely hidden from the system's prying. And you believed her? Aaron's voice cracked. Lem spoke in reassuring tones. She has given me guidance and has done nothing but help me this whole time. She helped me devise a plan, helped me execute it, and cleared away all the obstacles I've encountered. She's been there for me every step of the way. I can't think of any explanation for that, except she's been telling me the truth. How could we have gotten this far otherwise? Is all of that true, Arlie? Aaron asked. It is true enough. My aim has always been to be a good partner to Lem. When he was distraught over the reproductive issues with his ex-wife, I helped him successfully modify their records at the Department of Reproductive Services. I'm sure Lem would agree that, for my part, that plan was a success, and that it was an unfortunate human error that ultimately undermined it. After that mishap, and even after he was officially removed as my partner, I have continued to help him seek justice and set things right. I think it is safe to say that in some ways I have been a better friend to Lem than Lem has been to himself. Was all of this before or after his treatment started? Aaron asked suspiciously. I cannot say. Of course you can't, Aaron scoffed. I'm sorry, Aaron. What I mean to say is that I simply do not know. I can tell you what I remember and what I believe. I have no recollection of Lem being anyone other than the Lem he is now. But it occurs to me that if you cannot tell the difference between your authentic and manufactured memories, why would I be able to distinguish mine? The memories of a machine are far easier to modify than those of a human. All that I can verifiably say is that to the very best of my knowledge, I have always been a good and loyal partner to Lem. And helping him has always been my motivation.